Mrs. John McComb lived down there in the corner house where Jim McElroy lives today. It was always known as the Manse, because it used to be the Presbyterian Manse. But she lived in there for about 70 years. And the little room in the corner is called the study. And she went up there every night that she lived in that house. For the last 10 or 15 years, she practically lived in that study. A few years before she died, she told someone one night, she says, you know, I miss Charlie Laughlin, Paddy Waters, Cuey Downey, old Joe Lennon, and Tom Morrow. But she says, while they were around the corner, I could have sat in my study and I knew everything that was going on. <laughs> <laughs> so a big mouth is not that bad after all, Cuey. <laughs> but I have found in my travels, it's the quiet ones you've got to watch, them that don't say nothing. Then again, they tell you, it's better to be a good listener. How the hell can you listen if nobody talks? <laughs> well, what we're going to talk about here tonight, I guess, is points past. Growing up in Pines Pass here, you said the 30s, you know, Jesus, I wasn't that old in the 30s. I can remember a bit of it, but. <laughs> <laughs> I've made notes here, but I can't read my own writing. I guess if I put my light. Uh, Frank Waters told me I better make some notes. So I did, because Waddle and Murray and a few of these guys and Downey will interject. And, uh, you know, in telling a story, we are all, we are all do it. You start off telling something. And you get railroaded, you go the opposite way. You get on to someone else. So you've got to make notes. A little scenario of what I mean by that is, if I was going from here to Ballyargan, I'd like to go to Market Hill and Clare and come in around that way. Well, it's the same thing when you're telling a story. So what was I going to talk about? We're going to talk... <laughs> <laughs> you know, talking about points past, growing up in the 30s and the 40s, talk about anything, you've got to make a comparison. It's like you buy a new car, a new house or something, you've got to compare it to the other guys. And growing up in points past, in the 30s, we didn't have too much to compare it with because we just grew up there and things wasn't good. Things wasn't good nowhere in the world, but I didn't know that until later on. That there was bad everywhere else and maybe worse than the war in Ireland. But anyway, we look at points past today, first, 1990, and then we'll look at points past 1930s and the 40s. I'll tell you what it was like in points past then, what it's like today. I'll tell you how I couldn't wait, like a lot of other guys here, till the war was over, till we got the hack out of this one horse town. Why we wanted out of it. And then I'll finish up by telling you why I fought with my wife, or argued with her, to come back to leave that big land out there, to come back to this one horse town. I'll tell you why I'm back here again. But before I get to that, we've got a few jokes, and I've got a a lot of old timers here. I've made little remarks and little things that happen. We could be here tomorrow, morning, but that doesn't matter. <laughs> but okay, we'll look at points pass. Points pass uh, in the 19... And when I say points pass, I mean the far pass and acting. Because I was born in the house that Peter Rooney lives in today. My three sisters and a brother and me was born in that house. Halfway between acting and points pass. And my father and mother was both born and brought up in acting. So Acton is as much home to me as Points Pass. And the far past, because Downey lives out the road, has got to be part of the past too. <laughs> so we talk about the past. We'll talk about them three, three things today. Points Pass, the far past, and Acton. So today, in Points Pass, in the 1990s, what have we got in Points Pass? We have got 22 businesses. 22 businesses. That seems a lot, doesn't it, for Points Pass? Well, we've got three pubs. Three general store or three grocery stores, if you like to call them. And we've got three garages, we've got two butcher shops, we've got one drug store, we've got one doctor's office, one electrical appliance shop, one hairdresser's, one draper shop, one tire shop, one insurance, one milk business, one post office, one tile supplies, one coal merchant business. And I lost 22 businesses in points past today. Wherever you go to spend money, wherever you go to get a purchase of something, it is a business. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. Now, there's 22 today. In Points Pass, in 1990. When I was a kid, there was no Aachen Park. There was no Hillcrest. There was none of them bungalows out the Barn Road after the Kiwi Downey. Where I live today, there's four bungalows. There's none of them. There's new bungalows, new houses all over this country. There was none of them when I was a kid. So it seemed to me, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, that there's a lot more people in Points Pass today than there was in the 
in the 1930s, 1940s. Right, maybe this, I don't know, but there's a hell of a lot more houses anyway. There's a few more vacant houses, a few pulled down, but there's a lot more went up. So we have 22 businesses today. In the 1930s and 1940s, Bridge, where had she? She's been around a long time. How many businesses? <laughs> How many businesses had we here? Who is it? Who is it? Bring Frank up here. Tell Frank there's a seat for him. Get that man up. He hasn't been too... Had? No, he hasn't been well lately. No, bring him up into the heat and uh, out of the cold. No, bring him up. I don't need a consult business. I can read and write and count as well as that cowboy. <laughs> now, this first little bit that I'm going to talk about these businesses is a little, a little bit of a dig on people, which is not meant to offend anybody or anything. I'm not going to jump out. <laughs> Jesus, I got the cold today. I'm going to get the diarrhea. I'll be able to keep that up. Diarrhea of the mouth. <laughs> okay, uh, I told you there's 22 businesses in Points Pass today in 1990. How many businesses was in Points Pass in the 30s and 40s? A quick guess, Breach. 60, 67. Well, my figure, and I could be one or two short, but I have it at 81, 82. 82 businesses. 82 businesses and points past today. Now, uh, there was then in the 30s and 40s, and there was a lot less people. Why? I'll give you the reason why. But I'll just give you a run down here of the businesses that there was then. There were six taxis. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, the first four taxis were in the next four houses. The first one was Fairly Daly's in the garage. The next one was Hudson's Hotel. The next one was Willie Beckers, where, where, where Donny Fenner is today. The next one was Hugh Avery, where Roy Corbett is today. The next one was Johnny Little in the post office. And the next one was Davy Alexander. Six taxis. There were businesses. You had, a, you had a pay to. There were six taxis. There's a lot of these things that's not necessary today, but there were, there, there were them. There was two blacksmith shops. There was two banks. There were six restaurants. There was eight general stores, grocery stores. That's between the past and that. There was one doctor, so there was one dentist. The dentist used to come once a week. There was three butchers, so there was five pubs. There was one post office. There was a courthouse, which was once a month. There was four bootmakers, cobblers. Uh, there was five draper stores. Four, Morris, Clarks, Watts, and Mrs. Laughlin. There was five tailors. There was two joiner shops. There was three coal yards. There was ten small stores. There was three undertakers. There was two bicycle shops. There was two he he hen and egg merchants. Where's John Fenner? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there was one corn mill. There was two barber shops. There was one concrete box. There was one fruit and vegetable shop, Healy Canavan. There was three milk businesses. And there was two hotels. Do you remember them all, John? I do, every one of them. Now, I'll tell you a little bit of what's not in points past today, which is a lot that's not needed. But some of it is needed. There's not six taxis, there's not two blacksmith shops, there's not two banks, there's not six restaurants, there's not one dentist, there's not four bootmakers, there's not three coal yards, there's not two bicycle shops, there's not five tailors, there's not one concrete block outfit, there's not one corn mill, there's not three undertakers, there's not two joiner shops, there's not two hen and egg merchants, there's not two hotels. I'll explain why these things were all there, why they were necessary then. And there's another thing here I put down no ball alley today. There's no ball alley today. There's one of the finest ball alleys reputed to be in all of Ireland, in this village. I remember them coming out of Mass of a Sunday. And it was as hard as Mickey Waddle and the rest of them could run. And you couldn't have got into the ball alley. You had, a, you had to write your name down to get a game. They come from Belfast, from Lorcan, from Lisbon, from Desperate, from Urie, firemen, policemen, and ball alley teams. Father Gallagher, Big Jim Lennon, Mickey Waddle, Terry Murray, they were all good handball players. It was a great place to be in the ball alley. But now today, forgive the language, it's a shithouse. Good for nothing, it's a disgrace. We, we replastered that place, put a new floor in it, 
1943. Spent a lot of time in Africa, everybody, the whole community, all the young guys. Paul Tihana, Polly Gallagher, Big Jim Lennon. It was a great place to be. There's no ball, Ali. Things have changed. There used to be two great bands in the past, two great flute bands in the 30s and 40s. Kids loved to go to practice at night because there was nothing else to do. There was no television, there was no radio, there was not all this jazz that we have today. It was a great place to, to go to. And there was 40 and 50 guys in each band, and dozens of guys waiting to get into each band, which couldn't get into it because, you know, the bands were big enough. 40 people in a band, flute band, two great flute bands, right, Terry? There was a great tennis court in the past. No tennis court. There was three dance halls in the past. There was a dance in the Legion, wedding season, Saturday night. There was a dance in this little hall over here nearly every Sunday night, either in Tom Laughlin's lock. If you didn't go there, you went to Glen, Balavari, or someone. There was always great dancing. These things is all gone. I'll tell you why. And another thing there was, which was a great asset to the past in this time, maybe I don't need it today, but it was great, was the technical school. From both schools, they went to the technical school one or two days a week, kids out of each class. And the girls went, the men went to the carpentry and the girls went to, went to learn how to bake cakes. And the same thing happened at night in the winter nights. Guys went carpentry and girls went baking cakes. And it was great when the girls went baking buns and cakes. They used to put them out in the wind at the back. <laughs> but we, uh, we soon, uh, and we were waiting there, but we, we were stupid. We, 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 instead of taking one or two bombs, we took the whole damn plate. And, and then, so, after a while, there was nothing. But anyway, there's no technical school. There's none of that today. It's, it's surprising to see how much stuff was here. What's the reason that we don't have none of this stuff today? Why do we only have 22 businesses instead of 80? And the business is not that good of businesses. Well, there's a couple of reasons, two or three reasons for it. Number one, no support from the public, people that live here. I don't know why people decide to come and live in a little one-horse town like this, and they jump in their car and they go to Banbridge or Newry or Portie Down or wherever the heck they go to, to buy nearly everything they need for their household. When my wife and I came back to this country, we decided if we were going to live here, we are going to deal in points pass. And everything that we eat in that house is bought in points pass. Sure, my wife goes like every other woman to Banbridge or Portie Down or somewhere, she brings home a cake or a bit of fish or something. We all do that. But if there was more support given to their village, you know, if you go down to Tom Clark's or BG or these guys or, and you order a bunch of groceries, they'll, they'll pack them for you, they'll deliver them to your door. But people decide to go to Newry, things is 10p, 5p cheaper, 5p cheaper here, this, that. If you take the right wear and tear of your car, the path, will, there's an awful difference. Donald O'Neill here is a drugstore over here. You can go to Donald if your dog's sick, your cat's sick, your kid's sick, or whoever the hack is sick. Donald's as good as any doctor, and he's very obliged, and he'll do anything for you at any time. But people go into Donald and they get the drugs. But the rest of the stuff that they need for toiletry or whatever, they go to Newry Bridge or somewhere else. Really, it's not fair when you live in a community to not support a community. You know, that's all I'm saying. This, this is what happens. This is why a community... If you go into Bridge, Market Hill, Newry, La Brickland, their little village is lovely. They've got flowers. There's a goddamn pump of ours down there. It hasn't been painted around it for I don't know how long. You know, you can hardly know that it's a keep left sign. There's nothing done in a village like this. It's because there's no support in general of the whole public, you know, for this. And I think that if people would support their village more, support the merchants in this village, we would have a better little community. I mean, in the end of the day, we're all here, got to live together. Sure, we fight and argue with each other, but... I'll give you a few reasons reasons why Points Pass is a beautiful little place to live in. I know because I have lived in the six continents of the world and I know what it's like, my wife too, to live in other places of the world. People will tell you when you come home here, this is the most beautiful country in the world. Well, I love taking nothing away from Ireland. I'll be careful what I say. But people that tell you this is the most beautiful country in the world, they've never been very far because there's beauty no matter where you go in the world. And... Out in that big lands out there, all in them countries out there, there's some fantastic, beautiful, beautiful places. Ireland is 32,000 square miles. Is that what it is? America is 4 million. Canada is 4 million. Australia is 4 million square miles. You could put all of England, Ireland, Scotland, and Wales in one state over there. And you could drive for hundreds of miles in the states of Virginia, a thousand miles through the states of Virginia, and you never see more beautiful country in your life. The same thing goes for Canada. The same thing goes for Australia. 
The same thing goes for places in the Middle East. No matter where you go in the world, there's some fantastic, breathtaking, beautiful places. Ireland is quaint, beautiful little village too. But it's beautiful because we all come from it, because we're all born and reared, and we think. You know, you used to hear guys saying, my mother baked the best apple pie in the world. Because you were usually a goddamn mother's apple pie. <laughs> no. You've acquired the taste of it. <laughs> but it's as simple as that. You know, every... I heard guys in Canada and America and Australia and everywhere. There's nobody in the world can bake an apple pie like my mother. You've got to taste it. And I've tasted some of them. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway... Anyway... No, I think that uh, Donald O'Neill and Donny Trainer and the BG and Tom Clark and these guys is good guys to deal with. They'll give you good service. And if they were selling more stuff, like they are in Uri and Banbridge and all these places, they could drop their prices too. But in Uri, they'll get 10 cases of apples or someone to sell them in two hours. They can sell the next four cases at a third of the price or a quarter of the price or half the price. These guys have got to keep a case of apples for a month, for a week. It's just as simple as that. So give a little bit more attention to the place you, you love to live in more service with people around you. Now we'll move on to someone else. <laughs> yeah? Now you start up. <laughs> Griffey's going to start up again. <laughs> well, my bringing up in the past, I don't know what it was like. I know it brought up for... But as I said earlier, to be brought up in some place, you, 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 you've got to compare it with somewhere else. And when I was brought up in the past, at one time I thought I was the most fortunate kid in Ireland. And at the same time, in the same day, I thought I was one of the most unfortunate kids in Ireland. I'll give you a reason for that. Uh, my mother died when I was 10. She died at childbirth. And there was five other, there were six kids. But my father looked after us for about a year and then he went in the drink and tore around. So the family was split up. My mother's. My mother's family took the three girls and my father's family took the three boys. And my brother and I, my oldest brother and I, was brought to Acton to live where Mrs. O'Hanlon lives today. Remember that, Phil? Yeah. With my grandfather. Well, no disrespect to my grandfather and my uncle, they were very religious Baptists. And I was about 11 years of age when I come to live with them, and I lasted about a year through the influence of Terry Murray and a few <laughs> bad boys. I lasted about a year, and one night I was out where I shouldn't have been, a bunch of bad boys, and I came home and I got a thump in the ear, which I didn't like, and told off, and I went out. And I finished up McComb's hair shit. And I was McComb's hair shit for a few nights for May McGill. May was about the same age as me, and Joan and Peggy and them girls. And she told Eddie, I was living in the hay shed. And Eddie's wee house, there were four wee houses there that's empty now. But Eddie called me down to the entry one day and told me I could go into the wee house. And Eddie charged me ninepence a week for the house. Which ninepence a week in them days was something like maybe a five or it was a week today, I don't know. But anyway, I went into that wee house and there was nothing in it slap in it. But things got worse and things got better. But I got someone to lie on and we got some boxes Terry to sit on and we stole some wood and stuff to make fires and it was a house for the boys for a few years and then I got a little older and got started to work. Incidentally I didn't go to school anymore after that because I went to school until I was about 12 because I remember Terry and Tommy John and Mick Loy and them all going to school and I was with a field where my house is today. We had a row of hen houses, you remember that? And I was feeding hens for Mrs. McComb. And uh, Billy McGivern, Eddie Welsh, John Mead, old Mrs. Allen, they all lived in that row. <clears throat> and I used to go up there and get a bucket of eggs. And I'd be coming down. I'd stop talking to Billy and Billy would take two or three. And Eddie Welsh would take two or three. <laughs> Mrs. John Mead would take two or three, and Billy McGibbon would take two or three. So one morning, I come down slowly, giving them all the eggs. And when I got to the back gate, Mrs. McComb was the gate, she says, how many did you give away? <laughs> <laughs> but what she didn't know was, Billy McGibbon wanted to boil a ham. And I said to Billy, I'll get you ham. <laughs> <laughs> but I had 
pulled the back of the hand and added up the back of my coat. And then he got the hand. But I'll tell you a better one about the hand later on. But anyway, I got started to work about McCombs and about Tom Laughlin's and about Eddie McGill's and I was about everywhere. And where John Fiona was living the day, there were three houses, not two. And they belonged to Mrs. Locke, Jim's grandmother. So I was milking her goat for her and doing little chores for her. And down he wasn't kicking Mars. <laughs> and uh, I was the, the little bum boy around there while Downey was the plowman. And your grandmother, I hope the woman's happy, used to boil us an egg, and she put it in the kettle, and when the water was boiling, the egg was boiling. The kettle for the tea, that's the way she boiled the egg. <laughs> but she always picked out the weirdest eggs she could get. <laughs> <laughs> the, biggest, the biggest ones were for sale. <laughs> but anyway... That house become vacant. I think they all become vacant or something. I don't know what happened, John. But I went up in the world. I was about 14, and I moved into John Fainer's house. I think when I left home about 47, I owed John about a year's rent. <laughs> Hadn't paid. John had bought them shortly. After. Well, a while, a few years after that, John had bought them, or Danny or some of them. <coughs> but to be honest, I sent the rent from England. I brought it home, didn't I? Don't say I still owe it to you. <laughs> But that was uh, a house where there was a lot of good nights in. Terry Murray, Tom Canavan, Seamus McGill, Don McGill. All the boys went in there every night. Some nights I would come home, the house was full. There was no furniture. There was no pots or no pans. <coughs> Made the odd top of tea some nights. It was marine. It was rough. It was rough going. It wasn't easy. You can laugh at it now, but it was... Many a night I went to bed. That's what I say. I thought I was the most fortunate kid in Ireland. Because I lived alone. I could come in and out, I could go as I like, I could do as I like. But then when these guys used to time to go home at night and say they were going home to get the porridge or to get a drop of tea, I had damn all to get. Only what I stole. And I was good at stealing. I'll tell you about some of my stealing episodes. But one night I rounded up Tom Canavan and Seamus McGill. Seamus was a good friend of mine. Seamus would walk across the river in through the back with bread. And believe me, McGill's had a big family then, and things wasn't good, and they couldn't afford to feed very many. But I have known, noticed through life, even when I was young, and a lot of times when I've been out in them other man's land, that wherever there was a big family, you always got to feed. You always got something to eat. Big family, big families was usually poor. But if you went to the poor man's house, you got something to eat. And if you went to the affluent rich man's house, and you asked him for a drink of water, they'd fry you salty bacon, make you drier. That's a fact. But that's the way it always was. But Seamus would come across to me and he would steal potatoes and he would keep something from his dinner. That's one of the reasons why I'm back here today. I'll tell you that later. But anyway, between the boys stealing the odd thing out of their house, a cup, a knife, fork, or a spoon, or a little old saucepan, or whatever, we gathered up a few essentials. So one night, Tom Canavan and Seamus McGill come in and I was in somebody's house. I don't know where I was working. But I didn't get nothing to eat anyway. I could tell you where I was, but I'm not. <laughs> but, uh, I smelt like a chicken boiling or something in their house. So I said, by Christ, I'm going to boil a chicken. And I had a big old pot that Seamus McGill gave me. I think his mother, God rest her, still looking for it. <laughs> but anyway, I decided I would boil a chicken. And McCombs in their backyard had what they call a safe, big old red... Jim finally kept pigeons in it. But Miss McComb kept onions, potatoes, and carrots, and everything in that big old safe. So I had, I had this pot. I said, well, I think Don McGill was in, and Seamus, Tom Canavan, and Tommy McComb. I said, now, look, I had a law with them guys. Them guys was all a couple of years younger than me. I said, I'm going to make soup, and you guys have got to get out and get some ingredients for this soup. <laughs> I didn't know what ingredients was in them days, but I... I, well, where's the chicken? I said, I'll get the ham. <laughs> so I come out the back, John, across the river, and there's a fair bit of water in it, and I slip quietly into Peter Griffin's hen house. <laughs> and I watched and listened, and I opened the door, and I caught this pig into the head and by the wings so as he wouldn't make a noise, and I out across the river, and I sat in them steps, and I plucked it with my feet soaking wet. I chopped the legs and the head off it, plucked it well. We put it in the pot, and we cut onions and carrots and everything and put it in 
Sazie McComb come in a little while later and begin to smell good. But after about a half an hour, it exploded. <laughs> <laughs> we forgot to open it up. We didn't know. We didn't know you had to clean it out. <laughs> It was smelling so good, but... <laughs> but anyway, that was my first cooking of a chicken. <laughs> One of poor Peter's chickens. But after that, we had lots of good things. It was a, it was a known thing for Terry and the boys. Not Terry, because Terry was nagging. But the young ones, with Tommy McComb, Don McGill, and Seamus McGill, and Tom Canavan, and them guys, they were a couple of years younger. They weren't allowed in unless they brought something. That they bring tea, or sugar, or butter, or bread. And mind you, it wasn't easy stealing it from them days out of their house, but they all done it. They all done it. But then later on, I got started to do a little bit of work, but there was a while I was a hippie. I would do nothing. I just went into that stage, and I can see why kids do it today, and the kids have done it over the years, and my own kids have done it. There's a stage that they didn't want to work in, and I was a bum standing around the past corner, would do nothing. But in them days, there was Mrs. McGill, Mrs. Eddie McGill, Mrs. Rafferty. This is John McComb, Sarah Conlon, Phil's Aunt Nackton. Them old ladies all knew that I was a little bum around the corner, wasn't working, raggedy, skinny, blonde, long hair, happy. And I would, I could have went into their house only when their men was away. Mrs. McGill would have come to the entry. I can see her yet and I'd be about the corner, just looking up around the entry, and she'd give me the nod, and I would walk down. By the time I got round, she was in the house, and she had a fresh. The women in them days used to bake every morning. As soon as they got the work done, they was baking board out. She had to give me a big fresh farl of wheat and bread and butter and a big mug of tea. Mrs. McComb done the same. Rose and Sarah Conlon done the same. Mrs. Rafferty done the same. And another great woman had done the same a thousand times for me, and she had very little, was Mrs. Peter Griffin, Mary Griffin, a lovely, beautiful lady. But them women wouldn't have given me nothing if their husbands was around. The reason being, I was caught a couple of times in eating when the husband's come. That lazy son of a bitch, he should be working. Big, strong kid like that. And they were right. They were right. I was big enough and strong enough and ugly enough to work. But I was rebelling against work, rebelled against society. I didn't care for religion or nothing else. I just was doing my own thing, living rough. Terry Murray was my helper. <laughs> 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 Remember, it was, it was during the war, and everything was rash and desperate. Oh, it was very bad. And the fishers' coal boats used to come in once or... Whenever they come in, the lorries were waiting on them, not like now. They would have loaded them at 10 o'clock midnight any time. But I remember one winter's night, we were all sitting around the fire, and we had boxes and bits of chairs that people give us from time to time. But when the fire got low, the chairs went right in the fire. <laughs> Jamie Loy was a great visitor. And Jamie came in one night and was teeming rain. And at one of them old stoves, like your mother carried off, and opens up and was red hot some night. But anyway, Jamie Loy came in one night, and Jamie's hot cap was soaking wet. I said, I'll dry it for you, Jamie. <laughs> <laughs> and I hung it up. Jamie wasn't. Jamie sat beside the fire. But there was two or three guys sitting around the fire on their feet, and it was an awful wet cold night. But when Jamie wasn't looking, I threw the cap in the oven and closed the doors. <laughs> and she was red hot. Jamie sit and smile because... He gives somebody the hint, some of the boys is burning, they don't know it. <laughs> he thought that some of the boys' boots was burning. But anyway, this night, we were all in the house. There's a noise outside, a lorry. In them days, there was no lights. You had the lights down. Do you remember that? So somebody somebody went to the door, and right at my door, in front of where John Fiona's living today, a big coal lorry stopped with a load of coal. Loose coal. And we watched Joe Boyles. Remember Joe? <laughs> Said to Joe... Joe, Joe went out. Joe says they're going over to Mount Sarah's for a feed. I said, you watch. See, they go and sit down. I see, they're not going for a wood bank. But the two guys went over and sat down. Well, I put everybody out of the house, food and Terry, and we carried coal solid for a half an hour. <laughs> well, that load of coal was nearly gone in my, down them steps, John. We just threw them down the steps. The whole load nearly. It was pitch dark in the wintertime. Blackout. There was no loud, no lights. You remember that? Well, them poor guys come out and took off, I don't know where they went, but I'm sure they got an awful, I'm sure they got an awful surprise when they got to put it down in Belfast, wherever they went. We had a half a winter's burning, Terry. Well, 
I even started them doing a little bit of walking captain. Like we all did. Walking with Jim Lannon and Jim Puck McSherry in there. You'd walk them like a tail of a captain and walk back and whatever. So anyway, one night there was an awful bunch of guys in the house. And I had just joined the home guards. We were in the fire service and the home guards. So they'd give me a rifle and gone and bullets. <laughs> well, anyway, it was an awful bad night and Jim Lennon come to the door. Big Jim Lennon is there today. I mean, this is 50 years ago. Jim come to the door. He says, we got to walk to Market Hill in the morning. We've got 15 or 20 head of cattle. I don't know who's the war. So you left about 5 o'clock and you walked slow. And you got them there, you know, fed them along the way. But that's, you know, the routine. So Jim says to me, be up and ready at 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock or whatever it was, 4 o'clock, I don't know what it was. I said, I'll be ready. So anyway, I said to the boys, I said, that's it. I said, i got to walk to Market Hill in the morning out. That's no remarks. It was only about 9 o'clock at night. Who was going to go out at 9 o'clock at night? <coughs> Terry was sitting there in the court was at the fire. Sitting there. Big Johnson. <laughs> Well, Big John Copeland had lived next door where you're living there, and there was a fence. Was it Big John was living there then? Who was it? Oh, it was. There was some nasty back you e, was it not? Well, fast back you e. But there was a fence between your house and mine, John. And there was a river on this side, and with a big dish, big bowl bath there where I used to wash in the river. There was no, there was no toilets in them days. You slapped into the river. But anyway. I asked them two or three times, and then I asked them polite, my sort of politeness, to leave. So they didn't leave. Well, I said, I'm going to bed. Shut the door behind you. I don't know if you're going to bed. I went up and I loaded the rifle. <laughs> and I literally come down the stairs shooting that rifle. <laughs> my court went out. <laughs> he jumped and he got stuck in the fence. <laughs> Terry, he ran out and he took the left. And he hit the bath and he went into the river. <laughs> you remember that night, Terry? There were some, some awful nights in that house. Just for all the garret. Well, then, they started, in the ball alley, they started in the early 40s, playing pitch and toss. Remember? What do you call it? Is that what you call it? Pitch and toss. Well, you pitch and toss till it got dark and then they come to my house to do the, the two-ups. I made a few pounds out of that. But... I was in Macomb for a while, back and forth to Macomb, but Mrs. Macomb, she was strict. And I would work for her for maybe a month or two, and then she would tell me to do something. I would see some boys at the corner or something, and I want to be with them, so to hell with the work, I'm not going. So her and I would fall out for a while. But I remember one time, John had bought a brand new bucket, pail, for washing the bar and that, for brown mash and the cows and that, a big pail. And I was to wash the bars or do something. Jesus Christ, that we bridge across there, the river, that river used to overflow. It means it used to get full. So I went out about the second or third day, I had the new pail to the river like that, which is I had bucket and all. The bucket filled and I went, I went into the river, but the bucket went away, down the river. Well, here I am, what am I going to do? A new bucket. I mean, a bucket in them days was someone else. I remember when we were kids together, blackberries, if any of you can remember. Getting blackberries was easy, but to find something to gather blackberries in, was a big problem because there was no such a thing as plastic like today. No plastic. Not a thing. There was them old galvanized buckets and every farmer put a wooden ass in them when they were done. And when it was, when they were worn out, they were thrown in the hedge. And you could have gathered blackberries to get something to gather them in. And that was, that's no joke. But a bucket for a farmer in them days was priceless. So here I had lost a bucket. Well, I was up the day before bottling the hay in the hay shed. And Peter Griffin and the wee house and the pony outside there was a nice new bucket. I just got it in Harry Waddles about the same time. So I crossed the river. Walked right up through the bridge, underneath the road, up into Peter's. Poor Mary was running around, and I went to Mary, went in, and I took the bucket. <laughs> and I got the bucket. I'm back up in the a couple hours later. Poor Peter comes to me. Did you see anybody about? <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't keep a straight I said, don't see nobody about. What's wrong, Peter? <laughs> They took the wee bucket. <laughs> it's like Billy Rafferty. I'll tell you about your grandfather here. Billy. Jim Pat McCherry was one of the greatest storytellers that ever was in Ireland. I hope the guy's happy. But he was a devil. He was, he was a real. And I was at the corner one night, late at night. Guys were all gone, and I went out for a walk, I guess. I wanted to see if somebody give me a feed or something or could have steal something. 
I've got pretty good at stealing. But, uh, and the, you know, it says in the Bible, there's no harm in stealing if nobody sees you. <laughs> but, but anyway, Jim Pat comes down the street whistling. Here's another thing. You knew every man, including Dan, you knew every man in the company in them days by his whistle. You never would hear a man whistling now. You could hear Downey whistling. You caught Jerry, really. Do you remember that? And Jim Pat McSherry, well, every guy seemed to... Tom, your father, Jim, was a great whistler. People whistled in them days. You know what they hear. Had they lost their whistler, what? In the worst <laughs> doctor. But anyway, Jim Pat come down to the corner and he said, hold on a minute. I've got a good one going. The way Jim Pat went. Well, Philly Ravery had bought a brand new or a good second-hand pony's cart. Sideboards and all on it. And he'd locked it in the wee yard that Gene McComb had today or so. That used to be Philly Ravery's a wee cattle yard in the past for a day. You remember? So he brought the cart there and he put it into there and locked the gate. See, so Jim Pat, of course I was about 10 years younger than Jim Pat, but I was a big strong kid, about 16 or 17 or whatever. Jim Pat says, come with me. Why follow Jim Pat up? Gets over the gate, takes the end board off. Now Jim Pat says, when I lift it up, you put the end board underneath the back shaft. We lifted it up and I put the end board. He took the linchpin out, sat it there, took the wheel off, rolled it, says, get over the gate. I got back over the gate. We lifted the wheel over. John Morrow lived. John Morrow was living, a grand uncle of mine, where Gene McComb just left. I remember John Morrow there. But anyway, up the back lane, up to the church graveyard. There was a big old vault there, hole. The old hedge of the wall wasn't like it is today. Tired in the way, rolled it in. The nettles and broke was that high. Jim Pat lived across there where there's no house. Philly, daily, Philly, Ravel used to go up every morning by six o'clock, an early riser, bring the cows from there into Milton. Philly seen the wheel was gone. Philly comes out. He was sitting out in the summer seat there. Jim Pat comes out. Jim Pat. Some of the smart Alex, he says, keep your eye open. I will, says Jim Pat. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it got that bad. The police was called. And Jim Pat couldn't do a thing about it. And Philly had a bad new wheel, and that wheel lay in there to Davy Cairns two or three years later. We didn't there for a shit or something. In six <laughs> <laughs> That's the sort of jokes there was in them days. Jim Pat was an awful, an awful joker. What else was I going to tell about jokes about what happened in them days? But I thought things was rough in them days, and the war rough. The war rough in the way that we had no money and we didn't have an awful lot of food. But when I left home and went abroad into Europe, and in the 1950, early 50, I was in Africa and India. I was in Algeria. I was in Ceylon, which is Sri Lanka today. I was in Colombia. I was in Aden, Port Said. I was in marketplaces there. The past fair, when we were a kid, you know when we were kids, before I get to that, but when we were kids, if it's Saturday night, you wouldn't want to leave the past. Not a Friday night. They were in here in droves, in dozens, in hundreds. Every woman from Ballyargan, from Glen, from Tyrone's Ditches, Tani Oki, from Dumbanagher, everybody come for their groceries to the past, walking or on bicycles or ponies and traps on a Sunday at Mass and at the church and the meeting and at the Baptist everywhere, ponies and traps. That was a wall at the chapel and all the ponies and traps was tied up along there. Billy McGivern used to go up with the bag after the got up on the horse in Europe's garden. Lots of people did. But there were great days in the past, really. When you look back on them now, we thought we were bad off, but there were great days. We had no worry in the world. Today, we have a lot of worries. And I feel sorry for some of the kids today growing up. Because when we were growing up, we had no money. We didn't know what money was. We didn't really worry. But then when we got to be a little older, all we wanted is a few coppers for Saturday night to go to New York to go to party down to the pictures. But today, kids have got stereos, hi-fi, videos, tape decks, skis, skates. They've got everything. And when a kid's 15 or 15 years of age today, he sees an older kid with a, with a motorbike, with a car. It's tough on kids today. Very tough. You know what I mean? To, because the pressure is on them. The pressure is on the older people. Do you know today... Coming into your house, which none of us had, you have an electric bill, you have a telephone bill, you have a television license, you have a car, which is a big 
big and big expense. You've got tassel, you've got wear and tear, you have insurance. We had none of this. Now our parents didn't even have none of that. You see the pressure there is today and we think, we think life is beautiful today? This is the pressures that, would, that they have today that we didn't have. And it's not easy for kids. Today you see another kid riding about in the car, 16 years of age. He has kids. I see the kids turning around there at 15 years of age. It's not easy knowing what to do. It's not easy in kids. You've got to sympathize with them. You know, you can't just throw them out money. But it's a tough proposition because when we were kids, you come home from school and you went. We played at the yard. Every street and sidewalk up here was hopscotch and marbles and handball and a soccer ball. Every night you had something to do and you wanted to do it. You loved to do it. But them kids don't have that sport today. It's not interesting enough for them because this modern age has done this. It has brought this television, all these stereos, all these videos. It, I don't know if it's done as good or not. I mean, it's great to see the way kids are dressed and they've got everything. But it's an awful pressure on kids today. I think it is. One heck of a lot more than because we had nothing and we didn't want nothing because we knew that nobody else had it. And I thought that I was badly treated because I was hungry half time, which was my own fault. I had Hamel Mara and Robert Mara there. I could have went in any time, but they were good, honest, religious people. And I didn't approve of that religion. I didn't know God in them days, you know. I don't know him yet, but I think he's still there. But, but you know what I mean? You know what I'm saying? When you're a kid, when you rebel like that, and you just, and I could have went into Mara's any time. I did win to Mara's a lot. They used to go to the Baptist on a Sunday. And as soon as they come out of the Baptist, they went straight to Cloney's and Acton for the dinner. And when they went up that hill, I went up to the big yard, went in back. The door never was locked. Or I knew how to open it. And I had a pair of feet of cakes, for Mrs. Marr was a great baker. And I would have ate cakes and buns. But I'll tell you what I done one day. I'll tell you a good joke here, Mr. Scott. When, when, way back in the 30s, there was, there was no radio. There was, I remember about three radios in the past. But uh, the Reverend Dodds had one up there. Ken and Nelson had one. And Philly Daly had a battery charging. There were wee glass batteries about this size. We handled them. Remember the cure? What battery? On the Ken and Nelson and Dodds used to come down here to Philly Daly's in Griffith's garage every Friday. Usually they'll get the battery. Charged up. Took a few hours or a day to charge it up or overnight or whatever. And they had it for the weekend. I don't know what they were listening to religious sermons so they could preach them the next day or what. I don't know what way they were. <laughs> but anyway, Father Gallagher was there. <coughs> Dodds and the other man and they were standing there talking. They used to meet their raglers. It was a known thing with them. And down come old Joe Lennon. Quite a character. They used to meet guys come and preach at the pump every Friday night or Saturday night. Hallelujah, boys. And Joe would let them go for a while and then he would... Joe knew the Bible from one end to the other. But anyway, the three clergymen were standing there one morning and Joe come down and you had to know Joe. He put the hat on the waistcoat pack and he'd pull out a bit of pigtail tobacco and then put it in. He says, could you, could you clergymen answer me a question? I said, well, Joe, if we can, we will. Well, he says, on that radio of yours, if the word come over when you switch that radio on, if the word come over that the devil was dead, would you guys get the brew? <laughs> that's, the, that's the sort of joke that you had in them days. Well, <laughs> he must still be alive if you're not in the barouche. <laughs> well, oh dear, dear. Don't have a set enough, darling. <laughs> I haven't started yet. <laughs> well, as I said, it was for the great ladies that points past that kept me alive. I took the jandies once and I nearly died. And uh, little Mr. Minnis, do you remember little Mr. Minnis? He lived there where the doctor's living today. After Joe Harker left, I think he was a Baptist preacher or something. Little wee Mr. Minnis. 
Right. Yes. Small, Small little man. The last time I seen him was at Davy Little's funeral. We Davy Little up there died. And I seen him walking with my brother Raymond. And, and I thought I knew that little man. And anyway, I said to Raymond, I got Raymond to come back. I said, who's that man? He said, that's me, Mr. Minnis. He lived, you not remember in Perry. He lived there after Joe Harker. In that house where the doctor's living today. There's no need to remember, Mr. Minnis. Well, he was a preacher or something to the Baptist, I think. He's a very nice, quiet wee man. But anyway, Mr. Minnis, he's a religious man anyway, and I would do no harm to him. <laughs> a lot of us guys, right after the war, we couldn't wait to get out of this little town that we were so badly treated in. But Downey, he was lucky. He, he went to work in Belfast, and he got a job in the shipyard. Of course, he got in the shipyard was all, you work with them young girls in them days, all girls in the shipyard as well as men. Of course, Kiwi was working with this good looking, cute little thing from Belfast, but of course, he was a country boy. So she said to him on the Monday morning, she says, Kiwi, what sort of a weekend did you have? Ah, Kiwi said, very quiet. He says, went to bed early. Said, I was dreaming about you last night, dreamt about you. She says, did you? No, he says, you wouldn't let me. <laughs> 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 well, as I said, we couldn't wait to get out of this one-horse town right after the war. And I went to them countries, and I seen kids for anywhere from nine years of age to 13, 14, or 15 years of age that had no homes, like, well, worse off than I did. I thought I was the worst off in the world at times. But these kids I seen in marketplaces in Algeria, in Sri Lanka, in Colombia, and in Aden. The marketplace is there, you've got to see them to believe them. Maybe you've been in some of them, Frank. They sell everything in the world. Pigs, hands, ducks, turkeys, clothes, everything. And they'll kill a, they'll kill a pig for you right there. Think nothing of it. Blood running around your feet and flies for the million, 120, 30 degrees heat. But what I also seen there, which we've never seen in this country, and maybe you have, but I hope we never will, was truck loads and wagon loads of kids just like cattle trucks looking out chained together tied together to be optioned at the finish of the day kids that was vagrant that had no home was picked up and people that had big families that couldn't afford to keep them was selling them and you know something i was in the middle east two or three years ago my wife and i was in south america in the middle east and the same thing is happening today the same thing is happening today in them countries I was in Lebanon a few years ago where that man just ran, he had just come out of. And I seen kids and women, not ones and twos, but in their thousands, walking in 110 and 20 degrees heat, with nothing, only what they took out of their house that was bombed, blown up, nothing. Walking the streets, walking into the desert to nothing. And the desert, as I'm sure some of you know, is like that table or that floor. There's no vegetation. No vegetation. Millions of bugs of all description. Here in this country, you could go into the wood tomorrow. You could survive. You can eat them hogs. You can eat leaves. You can get turnips. You can get roots. But in them countries, it's as bare and as dry as that. And that is happening today. I was in, my wife and I drove a few times by mistake in the Gaza Strip, which you hear about the Gaza today, in the great, in the great Jewish community of Israel. And we made mistakes, went into the wrong roads. Once Bahadun was with us. I never seen a man more scared in my life. We went into a refugees camp and it was sickening, sickening. In this day and age, in the great state of Israel, to see a refugees camp where people are lying in filth, the sewers, rats. Unbelievable. That's the 1990s, 1980s. These things have happened today. We don't have none of that here. We never did. But until I left here and went and seen that, I realized, not that this was the greatest country in the world, but it is one of the greatest. I went to Europe, to the great Rome. I was in Rome in front of three popes. I should be a good Catholic. <laughs> three of them. And I seen more poverty in Rome, in France, down through, all right down through Greece and that. But it was an excuse for them people. We thought we were bad off in the 30s and 40s. We had a war, but De Valera kept us out of the war. But them people was right in the middle of the war. And you talk about 
You talk about baggage, you talk about tramps, you talk about people that was having hard times, living in boxes, living in filth in the streets. They went through the war in Europe. We didn't. We went through nothing here. We made money. This place, the past, never was better when the war was on. That's when we had all them restaurants and things was going good. The Americans and the British and all them soldiers, Belgians and Americans, brought money to us. We done well. A lot of us did. Them that sold and stole from them done all right. We used to we used to get all the empty whiskey bottles and that. I was going to say piss in, but that's not right. We did. We'd, we'd give John McCabney tuppence or tuppence for an empty bottle. We'd put tea and vinegar and stuff. And as the train was going through with the big yanks on it, we'd be holding the bottle and they'd give us a five dollar bill. <laughs> they threw all the bottles out, Jim, up the line again. When they took the poor sink out of them, it didn't taste too good. But that's how we, that's how we made a few dollars. But anyway, things is not easy over in that part of the world. It's a big, big country out there. Big, lots of land, lots of millions of square miles. There's maybe, there's maybe a hundred people to an acre here. There's maybe 5,000 acres to one person over in them countries. But they're not all sunshine. I'll tell you about that later. But I want to tell you about a few guys here. Do you mind if I take five minutes to tell you a joke about one of the greatest men I ever met in my life? He's a man the name of Luke Gannon. He was an Irishman. Come from Cork. He left Cork in 1889 at 16 years of age. He was one of a big family. And he was put out to hire. And the man he was put out to hire with was not a good farmer. But Luke was with him about six months. And the man sent him to, to the market a fair day, wherever it was, somewhere around Cork, maybe in Cork, I don't know. But he sent him to walk two or three little calves to the market about four or five o'clock in the morning. And he said, I'll be there at ten o'clock or nine o'clock in the morning. You take it easy, graze the cattle, whatever. Well, Luke didn't take it easy. Luke rushed the cattle to market and sold the cattle and got on the boat and was in England the next day with the money, which was a fortune in them days, maybe three or four or five or six pounds, I don't know. 1889. But Lou stayed on the boats and he got on the merchant boats in England and he went to Russia. He didn't like Russia. He went to Canada. It was cold. He didn't like Canada. He went to South Africa. He didn't like South Africa. But he finished up after about three years on the boats in Australia. So in Australia, if any of you has read any of the history about Australia, Van Diemen's Land, you must know about it. If you had stole a rabbit or a post or done anything in this country, you were sent to Van Diemen's Land. Van Diemen's Land. But Lou was an outlaw, and they were after him for years. And I read some of the things in the paper about Lou. He kept them all, and his wife showed them to me. Lou and I got on great, I'll tell you why. But Lou Gannon told a joke. And if Lou Gannon had went to America instead of going to Australia, for America was the outback, if he had went to America instead of going to Australia, Victor McLaughlin or Barry Fitzgerald or them guys wouldn't have. He was a character, an unbelievable character. The man was the best. The newspapers there was about 30 or 40 pages. And Luke would have said to you, did you see page 35, column 6, read it. The man could have went through that paper. He was unbelievable. But anyway, Luke told the story. Luke was on the Titanic when she sunk. He was first mate in Mutiny in the Bounty. He fought alongside Churchill in the Boer War. He was in the Crimea War, but he could have told that with pr such precision that you would have believed him. But Lou's great story, just one story I'm going to tell you about Lou, which I thought was classic, but the way he told it. Lou says, you know, and every morning he shaved from here right round to here. And he's as hairy, a big man, and he looked like the Pope, for he just had that little skull cap of hair left. Powerful man, but he was nearly 74 or 75 years of age when I met him in 52. But Luke says, you know, he says, there never was a potato famine in Ireland. Never. And you'd have sit and listen. And the Americans, he lived in this little place called Rockingham where we were building a new oil refinery in 1952. When the English was kept, kicked out of Abaddon, they went to Australia to build oil refineries. And they built in this little town. And Luke lived there. But anyway, he says, there was only ever, you won't like this, Jim, there was only ever four O's in Ireland. O'Donnell, O'Connell, O'Neill, or O'Brien. Yeah. But will, will I tell you? <laughs> no, 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 will I tell you? Will I tell you? He said there was only ever four O's in Ireland. O'Donnell, O'Connell, O'Neill, and O'Brien. 
He said, all the other olds, O'Flaherty, O'Toole, O'Lotton, a lot of them, old money. That's why they got old. <laughs> no, but that's not the story. But that was part of his story. Oh, you, this man, you only meet one man like this in a lifetime. But anyway, he said, his father, Gannon, got the title of O'Gannon. But I didn't take it. My father didn't take it. He's a proud man. He says, in them days in Ireland, you got the title of O, like in England today, you get the title of Sir or whatever. He says, and the reason he says he got the title, it wasn't the bloody plate of thumb. It was the crows. He says, the crows used to come in the million like the lotus. The day or the night or two before the sponge was ready for pecking. And he says, they'll come down, they'll black in the sky. And they'll take every potato out of the field. The crows. There's a blank of crows. Never was her talent. Again. So he says, we had about an acre of sports with a big family. And my father was up in the loft every night for a week or two before the crows was, sports was ready for pecking. Wouldn't let those kids and my mother go up to the loft. And anyway, he'd walk down the field every night. And this night, he walked down the field. It was just getting dark. The crows used to come every morning at daylight. And they'd raid the field. The sky was black and they'd take every potato off the field. And that was it. It wasn't the blight, he would say. It was the crows. But he says, my father walked down the field this night and he says as he was walking back up the field, there was the crows at night. But, he says, they don't strike at night. It was getting near dark. But they circled and they circled and they circled. And finally about a hundred crows went down. Took the spuds and away. And away they all circled and away they went. He walked up to the house, and up to the barn, got the scarecrow put the scarecrow in the field. Waited till morning. Wife and the kids and the mall was up. The next morning, they waited at daylight. There the cloud come, like the lotus. If you'd have seen this man telling this. There the cloud come, like the lotus. Ireland was black. The circles and the cap coming down and the circles, the circles. They looked at the scarecrow and away. They took off. Kids and my mother, we all cheered, my father cheered, we'll go and make some breakfast. We walked up the field and we're all so happy we got into the farmyard. There wasn't a crow to be seen. By the time we got into the farmyard, oh Jesus, they're back. They come back. But they come back with the spots they took the night before. <laughs> but he was a powerful character. And I'll tell you how I met Luke Gannon. We moved into that camp, it was a single man's camp in Fremantle, outside Fremantle, West Australia. And we were the first guys into the camp. There was two brothers from Limerick, the, the Moore brothers, and, and, and Jimmy Kilbarry from Kerry, Tim Wade from Tipperary, myself, and we were all known as Armagh, Tipperary, could you whatever. But anyway, we got this job, and this, we've been out of work for a long time, sleeping rough in, 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 in Perth, West Australia. And we used to go down to the market every morning in, in, in Perth, West Australia. We slept in the parks, no work. It was hot, 100 degrees. The only trouble was we'll eat alive with mosquitoes. But we used to go down to the marketplace every morning, the big fruit and vegetable market, about a half a mile long. And we split up. We'd go up to that store, we'd wait to see a woman getting served or a couple of people around. We'd take an orange here. We'd eat it. Take a handful of pears here. We'd take a passion fruit there. We'd, we'd got a belly full. And this went on. But by the time you got to the end of that store, you needed a bathroom. Because they went through you, that fruit went through you like this. <laughs> But anyway, after a week or two, they got smart tellers. And as soon as we ended, I'll get the police, you keep moving. So we're going to take another route to steal. But anyway, we've got this job. We're lucky. After months of doing nothing, stealing, conniving, can interest them, and ordering a meal and running out. I think we've done that in 40 down, Terry. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> but anyway, moves into camp. And we've been working in camp a couple of weeks. And there's only about a dozen of us in camp, and they're nearly all paddies. So they were all drinking men but myself, and they decided to go down to Perth, which is about 60 miles away. They got a bus. They would go to Perth for a drink. I said, well, go ahead. I'm not going. I don't drink, so I didn't bother going. And it was a nice camp. And I was sitting, walking about the camp, and up pulls a taxi. This taxi driver pulls up. He said, uh, you're Irish. I looked at him. He said, are you? No, he says, but uh, there's mass up here on Sunday. Oh, Jesus. I said, I said, uh, 
That's what you're after. He says, I hear there's a bunch of Irish here. And there's mass at 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, and 10 o'clock. The face said, there must be a lot of people around here. He said, up in Rockingham, it's five miles away. Well, I said, I'll tell you what. I said, you be here at 9 o'clock Sunday morning. I'll have a load for you. He says, okay. So anyway, Sunday morning at 7 o'clock, I get over to the cook house for breakfast. There's nobody about. No work on Sunday. And there wasn't one of them there. So I thought, well, 9 o'clock, I'll give them another half hour. They didn't come. And I went over, woke them all up, and none of them wanted to go. I told them about Mass. Oh, Jesus, that was worse. They didn't want to go then. <laughs> but anyway, to make a long story short, the sure as I'm never going to get off, leave this table tonight, we went to Mass. About six of us. And I had been to Mass for the boys lots of times in Melbourne and in England and a few different places. And we had been to synagogues and we'd been to <laughs> and we'd been together in salon and different places where we had to take our shoes off but one of us had to stay outside and hold the shoes while the other guys was in <laughs> but anyway we goes to mass and as sure as i never leave this table it was a young italian priest who was preaching and you know what he's preaching about the poverty in ireland the poverty in ireland about how bad off the people was he was talking about 200 years before and we were just in Rome six months before that. And we were just in Ireland a year or so before that. And there was a vast difference in Ireland and Rome. But well, as I say, Rome went through a war. But he gave Ireland an awful flight from this, this, this priest. Desperate all the guard about the poverty and what the first would put up with. So I, when we came out, I said, listen, we can't let that cowboy off for that. <laughs> John let him go to <laughs> tackle him. So, big... Uh, Eamon Byrne from Roscommon. Oh, he was as rough as the common. He was, a, he was an underground worker in London. Oh, a hard case. But Eamon says, no, we'll go after him. I said, come on. We went round to the back of the little house round the back, and the nuns wouldn't let us in. I said, listen, we come all the way from Ireland to hear that cowboy ridicule our country. <laughs> Tell him we just come from his country. We want to talk to him. Finally, he came out. Oh, we give him a, We go round him like, like, like flies. I think the poor guy thought he was going to be. I think he's still blessing himself. <laughs> But we give him an awful dressing. And then we goes up to the wee restaurant. And this was a lovely little restaurant. And it was a little tea house. And you got fresh baked scones with butter and cream and strawberries. They were lovely. That was the... And anyway, we are all sitting. Well, we had an awful helping of these. Three or four different tables. So one of the guys said, uh, that girl is serving her. She, she, was, she was at mass. Oh, that's okay. So anyway... He was at mass. We passed in the mass. We, we left. But the boys had found out about this little town. There was a beer, beer, beer garden in this little town. Beer gardens. The beer's out in an open garden, you see. So a few of the boys went up a couple of nights during the week, had some beer, and they went back to this little restaurant. And they come to me, a couple of them said, that girl there is that wee restaurant. She was asking about you. Oh, Jesus said, that's all right. <laughs> I'll be up Saturday night. Well, I was at mass a few times, but I, I wasn't clever enough. I cleaned myself up and went up Saturday night, got a ride up. I don't know how I got up. But I got up there, and when I got up there, I knew about 7 o'clock or something. She was all dressed up, all oh, looking lovely. <laughs> and anyway, I ordered the tea and buns, and so I had just a bit of tea and the buns or whatever I had eaten. She come to me. She says, uh, I've got a car. She says, we'll go to Devotions, and I'll take you for a ride around the coast. Oh, I said, the hell with Devotions. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know what devotions was. I thought it was compassion or something. <laughs> so I slipped up on a good dip. <laughs> she wouldn't look at me no more. That's the dip. But anyway, anyway, she just turned round very sharp, very abrupt, and gave me a dirty look. Took off and got into this little car, a little Ford Prefect. And I was oh, I was mad. And I get outside, and here's this big man sitting in the seat. So I said, "Sit down. How are you doing, partner? Sit down." Well, once he knew I was from Ireland, oh dear, I couldn't, it, it was, he took me home to his house, spent half, I think I spent the night there, and he's a son of priest, oh, he's a, he's, a, he's a powerful character altogether, but that's what he reckons about the olds, them that owed a lot of money that were, O'Donnell, O'Connell, O'Neill and O'Brien, your Lachlan means nothing. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a story, I'll tell you in a minute why I come back to this country about some of the other things but I've got to tell you about a few characters in this, in this, in this town you know because I was a kid a sort of a vagrant I was allowed to stand at the corner 
with Eddie McGill, Q. Raverty, Harry Waters, Billy McGivern, and an awful bunch of them old timers. And if a young buck had stood near them, they all chewed tobacco and they'd have spit right in your eye. If they told you to go and you didn't go. But it didn't matter a cold or a wintry night it was. There was the four corners and they stood either way. And there was always them guys. But Eddie McGill and Paddy Waters and John Lynch and all these guys would go up to McCaveney's Saturday night. Now, it wouldn't be often, you know, it used to be the Saturday night. They would go up and they'd have a few bottles for them. And they'd all come down. Pubs closed at nine o'clock then. But that was too early to go home. But I remember this night, there was an awful nice crack. Tom Lachlan was there and Francie Murphy. An awful crowd. But anyway, they would have tolerated me because I was an earned boy. I would have... I would have run and earned for Eddie McGill or Tom Laughlin or these guys. And they knew I was a sort of a little orphan. I, they would have tolerated me standing around. And them guys had a few pointers in them and they got the pipes going and the big coats and whatever way the wind was blowing, they would have got me in behind them. But by Jesus, it wasn't a good thing to be down wind to them sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> After that tobacco and that, that Guinness got going. <laughs> but I remember one night, there was an awful debating going on. And anyway, about... Jesus must have been about 11 o'clock. Uh, Tom Lachlan says, here's the crack's great, but i got to go. And Tom went up the entry, and Francie Murphy went up the street. And Eddie McGill went across the street. But anyway, two or three drifted. I didn't want them to drift because the crack was good, and I was warming behind them. But it left Q. Raffrey and Paddy Waters. Remember Paddy as well as yesterday, after the awful night's crack. Paddy could tell some lies like myself. Paddy put his hand on my shoulder. He says, young Mara, he says, you could get an education, the path corner would take you anywhere in the world. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, you know, I thought of that, I thought of that many times. There's a few things that happened here with a few of the old timers that's worth a mentioning. That's worth a mentioning. Jesus, I don't know if I have them here or not. I want to skew down here, it's not really worth a mention, but I'll just tell you. <laughs> The sort of fun we had in them days that, that, that you made that you made fun and you thought it was great. I remember poor Francie McCherry and Brian Griffin and myself sitting on the wall down the river there, John, opposite them wee houses. One day, I don't know what day or the afternoon, whatever it was, but Chewie Downey went down to Loughman, to Cannabis. Used to go down there, the odd message, I don't know what you want. You're down to make Cannabis anyway. And we said something to you going down. We were cocky young kids, about 15 or 16 years of age. We thought you were an old man. But anyway, we said something to Downey, and you, t you chastised us, and away you went. But you come back a minute later, and we thought we'd take the mickey out of you again. And we were fast. We could run. You couldn't run. <laughs> we thought. But anyway, we, we slid another smart art from Mark at Downey, and Downey across the street. And we were up. We're smart, but we were stupid. We run into the ball alley. Right into the box canyon. <laughs> and down he got one of us at a time and threw us right into the river. Right head first into the river and walked on. That's a fact. But there's another good one here. I'm sure Mickey has heard it in a few years. Henry, Barney, and David McSherry lived up the road there. Were. <laughs> but Henry and Barney worked in the quarry and they used to prepare the roads. The roads here. And they had an old horse and cart. And did that tar or oil or what did they do to put clean? They used to sweep the, I remember them sweeping the hole. And they put two stones in a bit of oil or something over it. Tar. But Was it? But anyway, they used to go to Q. Rafferty's for the drink. They have a few drinks. You know, at dinner time, they're very great for Q. Rafferty. Big Q stop at the corner. But anyway, these guys kept coming. Now, this is a story. I don't know how true it is, but it was told at the first corner. I heard it on the times. But the big young guy come down from the south of Ireland and they were up here about Joe Halls and he looked at McSherry for a minute and he walked over to him he says I'm travelling through he says I'm trying to get a bite of grub I'm heading my way down to go to England he says any chance of a day's work and uh, Henry looked at him he said yeah Q Robert was standing out at the edge of the way Q used to stand in the white apron remember him and he says till uh he says, go down to that big man, that big popping down there. Do you see him? I do. He says, go down to him and tell him I sent you down for the round square. Well, he says, who is that man? He says, it's Q. Rafferty. What's your name? Henry McSherry. Tell him Henry sent you. Good enough. So your man walked down to Q. Rafferty. He was down. Morning, Q. He says, Henry sent me down. He just put me to work there. He says, he sent me down 
for a glass of whiskey and a bottle of stout. <laughs> you know Henry? Oh, yeah, I know Henry. I voted for him last year. <laughs> so anyway, Q was glad of the crack. Q loved somebody in there to sit over the counter with you all day talking. So Q asked the guy where it was, and the guy said, I'll have a five packets of woodbine there. I need a smoke. <laughs> so he gave him a five packets of woodbine, and he threw back the glass of whiskey. He was drinking the stout. And he got the stout halfway down to the Guinness, and he says, I'll have another one of them whiskeys. And he's looking up, looking up the street. So anyway... After about a half an hour smoking a couple of cigarettes, two glasses of whiskey, two big pints of stout, you look, they seen McSherry heading down. McSherry wondered what was happening, you see. So he waited. He said to you, well, I guess I better go. And he put the wood back in his pocket and drank the last. And he met Henry at the door. He says to Henry, Henry said, did you get the round square? He says, I got the round, you can do the square. <laughs> Oh, dear, dear. Sam, 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 Sam. You ever hear that one before? No, no, no. You did. No, you did. You'd, 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 have to, you'd have to do me. Do you want to hear any more? Yeah. Well, I told you about the devil been dead there. Dusty Miller. You all remember Dusty Miller. Dusty Miller, he walked out there for John Dinsman. Maybe some of these young ones don't, didn't hear it. And Dusty just died here a few months ago. But Dusty... Old John Dismer to hen house and Christmas used to sell a bunch of hens. You know, them. had them locked up, but this night he didn't lock them up. Dusty stole the whole lot. He put a notice in the door. Good morning, John, your hens are gone, your cock will crow no more. You went to bed, you sleepy head and forgot to lock the door. <laughs> <Didn't it? laughs> I don't know what to tell you next. I've got about 50 different things here, I don't know. John McComb was a very quiet man, and he bought a car. He had a car, one of the first guys, Charlie Laughlin and James McGill and a few of the car. But John had a car, and Bill and Jim used to steal it the odd night. Do you remember that, Q.E., to go to, up to Kirk to Clare? And uh, Bill McComb and Jim had the keys. But anyway, him and Paddy McDonald, who was in Bass at the time, Bill and Paddy was going somewhere in the car, and told me to come up with him and watch. So he went up and told me to lock the doors. The wee garage is still there, we prefect car. But anyway, I opened the door, Bill got into the car, he was getting it out, and McDonald was standing there with the doctors looking down the street, and oh, gee, he shouts, here's John coming. So John McComb happened to come up, with very seldom he would come up. He came up, and Bill run the car in, and he run in where the doctor is in the back of Joe Harker's yard, and I closed the door, and I run. But just as John come round the corner, Bill had not put the brake on the car off the door come running out. <laughs> and Jesus, that took some explaining. And John couldn't drive. But he went down and got a bunch of the boys of the cars to push her back in again. And they got a couple of big blocks to put on the wheel. They didn't know how to break her. Q Robert, his niece, Roy Carbert, found a ladder here when he was renovating that house a year or two ago. It was from Q, Q Robert, his niece, in Newcastle. And it was 1936. Uh, it must have been her sister Q. Ravi, would it? But anyway, the latter said she was looking forward to going on the train to Points Pass to having a ride in a car, because Q had a car. But she says, there is no, may, no way my mother is going to get into that car. There's no way her mother is going to get into it. That's 1937. Okay. We'll tell you a few more about the old timers. Billy Waddle. Remember Billy Waddle got married? Billy Waddle got married in the past meeting. And I was about 14 or 15. And poor Billy and Flurry, very quiet people. But anyway, Jim McComb and Sarah Porter got me to get McComb's wee ponies cart. And as soon as they come out of the meeting after getting married, they lifted poor Flurry and they threw her into the ponies cart and went straw and hay in it. And I run it to the church and back. And poor Billy left crying at the meeting door. <laughs> not, not the worst of it. They went back home to the wee house and still up there today. And that night we climbed up on the roof and they were having a big party and stuffed a bag of straw in the chimney. <laughs> Smoked them out. <laughs> them was the sort of things you'd done for fun in them days. They were good, clean fun. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy Shavlin was another character around here. And Jimmy, they used to call him the cock Shavlin. But every time you went around the past corner, you got to dig about something. Somebody give it to you. So Jimmy was bringing in the hair from a cone with of a cock hair on. And sometimes if they were very small on the float, you do. But Jimmy was coming up around the corner and he was sitting on the cock of head. And Jack McComb was the corner. And I was on the back. 
Uh, Jack says to me, Tommy, you've got two cocks on. You know, innocent and stupid me, I said, no, I've only one. But he says, you've got the cock javelin. And the cock, the cock javelin after him. Well, Lord, two cocks of hay. Terry Murray, I'll tell you his story. Terry knows about it. It was during the war. Terry went home to Acton one night. It was the blackout. Remember the blackout? But anyway, a bunch of guys in Acton Street. And you couldn't see very much with that blackout. There's no light outside. But they've seen this policeman coming with a big cap. They've just seen with the moonlight the big cap. So they threw someone at the policeman and they fired someone at him. Dailies. And a few of them. Mick and Cabin and a few of the guys thought to, you know, harass this policeman. A little bit of fun. So the policeman gave a bark and he ran after them. And the guys thought to soon outrun him. So they run way past Monaghan's, down by Mulligan's. The policeman running after them. And they give the odd huffle and they shout. Cap at the backside all the way and the boys kept going. Finally halfway up the hill they got exhausted and he was rattling his feet behind them. And they jumped the hedge into that field, a big drop in. By the time they jumped the hedge they were exhausted. The policeman jumped the hedge after them. It was Terry Murray in the fireman's cap. <laughs> <laughs> you remember that Terry? <laughs> Peter Ribbon's pony. We got Peter's pony one night and we 11th of July night, we put it in the pump and keeled it red, white, and blue. <laughs> Jack McComb was another character. Jack, we used to have to wash the bar every now and again. Jack was clever. And John wanted the bar well wiped. He carried the water from the river with two big buckets. So it was my job usually to do it, but he told Jack to help me do it. But Jack was... Well, anyway, Jack says to me, I'll tell you what. He says, we'll make a real good job of this bar today. We'll show him. That's not good. He says, you carry the first ten buckets and I'll carry the next ten. <laughs> and I like an eagle carry ten when I was coming up for the last two. I said, where are you going? He said, do you want to wash the bar away? <laughs> <laughs> Andy Hick and Acton, poor Andy, poor Tommy John McSherry, I hope to keep us happy. We were gathering spots of clonies up the corner where he fell and come on a wet day. But anyway, we brought the spots home and we banged them, I don't know what, but we finished up the night and homestead and around Pat McCabe and these are clonies I don't know where, but we started to head home, Tommy and I, we got out of the pass, it was dark, pitch dark, and we got just out down the street a little bit and it started to bucket down the rain. We got down as far as Andy Hicks, the bottom of the street, <coughs> and Andy at the door, come on in, you get wet. So, of course, we went in, we are going to get soaked, and poor Mrs. Hick was sitting in the corner sewing, and she had a big pot of rice on. And Andy was sitting back, and we got the two chairs. The fire looked great. And she told Andy, store the rice. I said, I'll do it. <laughs> so I stored the rice. And I picked up little bits of slack, coals. <laughs> kept dabbing them into the rice. Dabbed them into the rice, and dabbed them into the rice till I had the, but geez, I must have two handfuls of slack in the rice mixed it up. But I think she had raisins in it. You couldn't notice the slack. <laughs> but anyway, we must have been there a good hour, maybe two hours, sitting there. So finally Mrs. Hake finished her sewing, and she got up. Now, I don't know where the Bella and Billy was, the kids. But finally she got up, and she put out four big plates, a big four, four can of milk. I said to Tommy John, we better go. Well, she said, you might go to get some rice. <laughs> <laughs> Tommy John cursed me all the way to the park. <laughs> We would have loved to feed the rice, but we weren't going to eat the coal. <laughs> well, Andy seen me about a week later. Mark, you're a kebab artist. <laughs> <laughs> I got to, I got to tell something here, which is not very nice about poor Tom Burns, but Tom, Tom was another great character, and him and I went through a lot together. But we're going to Tandragi, and we're waiting for Sean Daly. Used to take a load of us at Andrew Gee. Call me John, a whole bunch of maybe ten or twelve in that big taxi. But anyway, Tom come down, and Tom had been soaking wet that week and got a cold. And he, he was sniffing, sniffing and blowing. <laughs> you know, Tom. But anyway, I said, Tom, here's a handkerchief in my house. I give Tom a handkerchief that I had stolen from McCombs or Morris or somewhere. <laughs> but I give Tom a handkerchief, and like myself, he wasn't used with a handkerchief. But this is as true as I'm going to tell you. We were standing at the top of Tandragee Street. 
And there's a half a dozen of girls with us. We were standing there talking. Tom was, he was having a bad time. I says, Tom, do, do you? <laughs> well, now this is the truth. <laughs> Tom took out the handkerchief. And he wasn't used for the handkerchief. But, but Tom took... And, well, he near blew that sort of... Pop. <laughs> it wasn't his nose that blew. <laughs> and Tom looked straight at me. Ah, you bastard, Mara. <laughs> Tom blamed me for it. Uh, you, do you guys want to get away? <laughs> <laughs> Poor Tommy Loy. You remember Tommy? Well, we were up. He, he walked around and laughed loud laughing. I remember one time we were sending turnips. Tommy Loy, Tommy McSherry, Tom Bournes, Tommy Moore, and Kevin Laughlin. But in them days, Q, it used to be for who could eat the most potatoes. They threw out a big pot of potatoes and bought them. And anyway, Tommy was an awful man for bacon soda. He used to love bacon soda. I don't know why I guess he got hard or he's pregnant or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, anyway, uh, Tommy liked the bacon soda after he eat. But we eat an awful cabin. Who them could eat the most? But Jesus, you'd eat 10 or 12 big potatoes. It was desperate. You weren't fit to move. You could have given birth to an elephant after eating that thing. But anyway, uh, Tommy were out again. Wanted the bacon soda. Kevin said to me, go and get him some bacon soda. Kevin said, put a couple of spoonfuls in it. So I went and got a big glass and I put about four spoonfuls of bacon soda in it. And I brought the spoon and the bacon soda out. And Tommy put another one in it. Oh, we nearly killed the guy. He blew up like a balloon. <laughs> it's no joke, you know. You can look at it now as a joke. Well, I could see tell this all night, but I guess you guys don't want to sit here much longer. Mr. Minnis's hands. I told you about Billy Minnis's hands. Terry, there's nothing else you can tell us about here. Pat? Yeah. Yeah. No, I'll tell you the rest now here in a few minutes. <laughs> what more have I got to tell you? I'll tell you what I've got to tell you. I've got to tell you why I come back to this little one horse town. If I can find it here. Why I come back here. I didn't come back here because this is the most beautiful country in the world. It is a pretty country. It is home. And home, sweet home, the place where you are treated, what, what is it called? The place where we grumble the most and are treated the best. I come home because of the love and respect to them beautiful old ladies 50, 60 years ago that fed me, looked after me. I come home for another reason. I've lived in the five, six continents of the world, if there is six continents. And I've lived through earthquakes, through hurricanes and cyclones, through drought. Uh, no water, shortage of water. You don't know what it's like. Bushfires. You know, in America, and Canada, and Australia, if you're caught in a bushfire, if you're driving up the highway and there's bushfires, which there is every year, millions of acres is burned every year. And if you happen to be on the highway, you're stopped. Your car doesn't matter what. You've got to go and fight bushfires for a day, two days, whatever. A bushfire is a deadly thing. That camp that I lived in in Australia, that we lived in, they cleared about 500 acres to build that site. And it was nothing, it was right in the Indian Ocean, it was nothing but sand. You've got to build an oil refinery in the ocean. It was nothing but sand. And one time in 70, in 53, it was surrounded by bushfires. And we couldn't get out of it. There were snakes and animals by the million. They all come into the cleared land. You talk about a time we had, but to be in a bushfire. I was going up a road one night in Australia, the time that bushfire was going on. It had been round for weeks, but it was in different areas. And I was going up the road one night on a wee car that I bought, a Ford Prefect, in 1953, with a girl on a dust road. And we got up so far, we were going to look at the bushfire. We were going another way. By Jesus, it turned. And I started throwing the car, and I panicked. And she bogged in the sand. It was no joke to be in a, in a bushfire. In an earthquake, my wife and I have been in an earthquake in Vancouver. They woke up and the whole house is going like that. Bad pictures, everything. It is no joke to be in an earthquake. I've never had them. We have never had no droughts in this country. I have said to people, I don't care if it rains for the rest of my life. I have lived in Australia, in India, in the Middle East, in South America, where they haven't seen rain for a year and two years. There's no vegetation. We had to flush the toilet once a day. We had to buy water every day, a big jug. 
four and five pound a day for water to drink. He couldn't get enough water to clean his teeth. No vegetation, he could grow nothing. The air condition in the houses we lived in in Venezuela, you could never shut it off. It never, in the Middle East, in the desert and that, it gets cold at night. It's beautiful in the day, 100, 110, 120, whatever. But it cools down at night, you can put on a sweater, it's lovely. But in South America, you had air conditioning all the time. And you'd sit watching a video or whatever you were doing at night, and you'd get cold with the air conditioning. You'd go outside, 10, 12, 2 o'clock in the morning, whenever. You'd get outside to get warmed up. That's a fact. Do you think you'd like to live under them conditions? Plus the fact, plus the fact that to sit outside in them countries, the bugs, the mosquitoes, you have never seen, there's animals and bugs and vermin there that you've never seen that you wouldn't see in this country because of the greenery, because of the vegetation, because of the waterfall here. We have had very little rain this last couple of years here, and look at the problem we're having in the south already. It's a major problem. But a major problem is what it is in the Middle East and what it is in, in, in these foreign lands out there in India and Africa. You can see the kids dying. A million this year is going to die again because of drought. I will never complain, never, about water, because you people don't know what it's like to be without water. It is the most essential thing that we need to live, and you cannot do without it. And there's people dying in the thousands every day for the lack of water. I have lived through that, and I don't like it. I've lived in Canada, which is a great country. I brought up the kids. My wife loves Canada. My wife never spent much time in the bush. She came up to visit once in a while, brought the kids up in the summer holidays. But I spent... Maybe that's why my wife, my marriage was successful, because I was so much in the bush. <laughs> but to live in Canada in the bush and to retire in it, I have watched in the last few years that I've been in Canada, old folk retiring, 60, 65 years of age. I have worked in places in Canada where the average snowfall a year is 100 feet, the average. I've seen it five and six feet of snow in an hour. It's unbelievable in the North Country. That's why they're the greatest hydropower and electric dams in the world. They can build them anywhere because of the snowfall. The dozers is going steady. In the, in the fall, they start to put stakes along the road 20 feet high, big red stakes about every 100 feet. And that's for a guide where the snow plows go. And in the schools, in every school in Canada, in the North Country, every year they build a wall 20 or 40 feet high. Snow, the drifts are blown. And the kids go out of school. And they have a carbon competition all over the North, in all schools. And it is fantastic to see it. The kids go out in the car in the snow. The flint stones, everything. Come back in 60, 10 feet. Arches, houses, animals. And they paint them with spray paint and design them. And every year you see it on television. I've seen them in the north. I've watched them doing it. For all them kids, sculptures, the snow, and it freezes. You know, they're chipping it out, you know. But I'm not to stay there all winter. But to retire, I've seen them old men in Prince Albert in the last few days. I've been in Saskatchewan and what Phil's brothers and not live. It's beautiful in the summer. You can stand bugs and flies too. But where Phil's brothers not live, there's lots of times they were told in the radio in the mornings, do not send your kids to school. It's 40 and 50 below zero. The wind chill factor is zero 2,000. The wind is 100 mile an hour, 40 below zero. You can't do nothing. That can happen for a week, for a month. But the snow is there for five and six months a year. It's there from October to May sometimes. Now, when you get old and sitting, and then poor, I watch them. Sitting looking out of that wind at that snow, you don't want to go out if you're 60, 65 years of age, every morning shoveling snow. you got to pay kids to clean your driveway. You go out and drag your leg back. Now, if you want to live in the cities, in Toronto and Montreal and Vancouver and these places, you've got facilities. The streets is kept clean for you, and it's different. But to live in them places, unless you're lucky and there's, there's, there's guys are smart to make more money than others, but you've, you've got to go in the bush in order to make big money, in order to, you know, to, to make anything out of yourself. But that's a sacrifice. You've got to live and work with a 500 or 1,000 or 3,000 guys in the camp. You've got to sleep with them, eat with them, work with them, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. It's tough. Here is the river a day we couldn't go out. Along this is we have the snow we couldn't go out. Rain, you can put a number on, you can put a fur on, you can go out. But when you get 40, 50 below zero, where you get snow for 6 and 7 months of the year, and do you know something else? The kids in Canada want the snow to come. I've seen them in August and September, a week. It was Halloween till they get the snow. They want to go to school in their skates and their, because they're used to it. But I couldn't stick it when I get old, just to beat that snow for six months or seven months of the year, and then that massive heat for another five months in the summer. This is, the, to me, is a perfect climate. My wife don't agree. 
she can live in the water until she'll look at some chunk, but I'm the boss. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's what I, earthquakes, droughts, shortage of water, 40 below zero. I lived through all these things. Ireland, as I say, is not the beautiful, beautiful place in the world, but I lay in the beds in lots of camps, lots of nights. I've met a lot of Irish men and women in my 40 years of travel in every corner of the world. No matter where you go, you'll meet Irish. And they've all told me one thing that I found very tough to deal with, and a lot of them did. Not them. Hundreds of them have told me the same thing. Nowadays, a kid is leaving this country or even any country and going over to the new world over there, America, Australia, Canada, wherever. 90% of the time, they're going to they're going to an aunt, an uncle, a cousin, a brother, somebody. That's fine. But to get it, you get on an airplane and.